My name is Jesse Green. This lecture is for the Parker University Continuing Education class for Animal Chiropractic. Topic is Ethics and Legal Considerations. Just to give you a brief idea of who I am, uh, I'm an attorney and I've practiced in Texas since 1986. I've worked with chiropractors extensively since 1990 or so. Uh, so it's been over 20 years that I've worked with chiropractors, so I'm familiar with chiropractors. And let me start, of course, with the obligatory lawyer joke. An elderly man who was very well off was, was on his deathbed. So he calls to, his, uh, uh, to meet with him. He calls his three most trusted advisors, his priest, his doctor and his lawyer and he explains to them that that even though he's been told you can't take your money with you he wants to try so he's going to hand and he hands each of them an envelope with one million dollars in cash and he explains to them that he wants them to place that envelope in his coffin and you know if he can't come back and get it he's got plenty of money for his family they'll never miss it but if if there's any way for him to come back and get it, he plans on coming back to get it. A few weeks later, he, he does pass away, and, and, and at the funeral, the three advisors, the doctor, the lawyer, and the priest walk by the coffin and, and pay their last respects, and each one of them places an envelope in the coffin. After the funeral, they were, they were talking to each other in private, and uh, the priest starts off first and, and says, you know, I've, I've got to tell you guys something. Even though he gave us an envelope with a million dollars, i got to tell you, I took $250,000 out of the envelope to support the church school because I knew how important education of children was to, uh, to, to the uh, man who passed away. Uh, and I'm really sorry about that, but you know, I figure it's probably no harm anyway. You know, the doctor looks a little sheepish, and he says, you know, I've, I've got to tell you guys something, too. You know, the hospital's building that new wing for children's care, and I know how important uh, children's health care was to him, and, and I knew he would have wanted to support it. So I, I took $500,000 out of the envelope and donated it to the hospital to support the children's wing. And by the way, it will be named after him now. The lawyer gets indignant, and looks at both of them and says, I can't believe the two of you. I will have you know that I left my personal check for the full amount. So that gives you an idea about ethics and lawyers. What I'm going to talk about through this lecture is we're going to first talk briefly about ethics. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about the licensing rules for animal chiropractic. And we'll talk about informed consent, malpractice claims, and record keeping. So let's start with ethics. The way our society looks at animals and animal rights is changing. Historically, our society looked at animals as a piece of property and as a, a not having any particular or not much in the way of rights. But our society has become much more sensitive to animals. Our families have become much more connected to their pets. And as a result, we start to place more and more value on the animals and the importance of their rights. And I think the ethics over the next 10 to 20 years will reflect our growing value, our growing importance of our animals. As an animal chiropractor, you need to be aware of, of several obligations. The first obligation is to your client. Now, for chiropractors, this is a little bit different. Typically in a chiropractic patient relationship, you have the doctor working directly with the patient. You don't have a client in between the middle of the doctor and the patient. 
Now for those of you who are veterinarians, you're already used to this situation. But part of the ethical obligations are to be honest to the client and to respect the wishes, the decisions made by the client. Uh, animal chiropractors also have an obligation to their peers and to the profession. As a relatively young profession, uh, the reputation of the profession is critical. It's very important that animal chiropractors be honest. It's very important that animal chiropractors don't exaggerate or don't make promises that they can't keep. Uh, like any profession, a few bad apples can spoil the reputation of the entire profession. And, and of course my experience is with the legal profession and the chiropractic profession. And I look at both of those professions and I do believe that most of the people in those professions practice very honestly, work very hard, and try their best to take good care of their clients and their patients. But I also know that there's a small percentage in both professions who are, are really in it only for the money. And because they're in it only for the money and they communicate that very clearly to their clients and patients, they really do a lot of damage to the reputation of the professions. In a young profession like uh, animal chiropractic, that damage to the reputation of the profession could bring it to an immediate halt. Animal chiropractors also have an obligation to protect the public health. Animal chiropractors need to be aware of situations where they should uh, make appropriate reports or take appropriate steps to protect the public from animals that are dangerous or to protect the public and other animals from diseases that may be very contagious. Finally, there's an ethical obligation to the animal. Now, I know, as I started out, some people look at the animal as nothing more than property. But the bottom line is, is in most cases, pets are more than property. Owners, clients would not spend the kind of money that they spend on the health care of their pets if they looked at them only as a piece of property that could be easily replaced at a market value. That pet has a very special uh, very valuable uh, value as, as a uh, part of the family, a member of the family. So general rules, when animal chiropractors are making decisions, they should make those decisions in the patient's best interest. Now, they also need to be careful that they respect the client's decisions. Sometimes what's best or what the the animal chiropractor thinks is best for the patient may not be what the client thinks is best for the patient. There's also a general obligation to be honest. Animal chiropractors should be honest when they communicate to the public, when they advertise or speak in public, or try to interact with the public and educate them about animal chiropractic. They must be scrupulously honest uh, especially the chiropractors need to be careful that they represent their credentials accurately. If you are working around animals and you identify yourself as a doctor, most people will assume that that means you're a veterinarian. So for the chiropractors who are working around animals, they must be careful to identify themselves as chiropractors so that there's no confusion that they might be veterinarians. Animal chiropractors also must be honest to their clients. Uh, they must be very careful about what they recommend, make sure they are making recommendations that are in the patient's best interest, not recommendations that are in the doctor's best interest. They must be careful not to create unjustified expectations, uh, make sure the client has a realistic understanding of what animal chiropractic can accomplish and what the limits of animal chiropractic are. Animal chiropractors should also be honest with their colleagues. When they are consulting with colleagues, they need to be honest. When they are talking about their accomplishments 
or the results they've received with animal chiropractic. Animal chiropractors must be very careful that they represent honestly to their colleagues uh, what they've achieved and, and the accuracy of what they achieved. Uh, one quick way to do a lot of damage to the profession would be to publish research reports that are not accurate. Um, as with any professional, animal chiropractors should provide only care that is necessary. They should not provide care only for the purpose of generating a fee. They should provide care because they believe it will improve the animal's condition and the animal's health. Conflicts of interest. The doctor, of course, always always has a conflict of interest between their, their personal interest in receiving a fee and the best interest of the patient in not receiving unnecessary care. Doctors must be careful that they are making decisions and they must be very uh, scrupulous in the way they make decisions that they are making them for the right reasons. Uh, other conflicts of interest might occur if the, uh, 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 for example, in the area of referral fees. If a veterinarian is receiving a referral fee for sending patients to a chiropractor, are they sending the patient to the chiropractor because they earn an easy referral fee, or are they sending the patients to the chiropractor because that's in the best interest of the patient? And they need to be careful about how they make decisions when you have that kind of financial conflict of interest. Confidentiality. Treatment of animals, uh, just like treatment of people, is protected by the rules of confidentiality. Uh, I know the chiropractors are familiar with, with the HIPAA rules and the, and the extensive rules of confidentiality when you're working with human patients. And I know the veterinarians are generally familiar with the rules of confidentiality when you're working with animals. What I want to be sure is that the chiropractors understand that just because they're working with animals, it doesn't mean they don't need to protect the confidentiality of the owner and the animal. They need to be very careful that their records are kept confidential. They need to be very careful that they don't gossip or share stories. Uh, and they need to be sure their staff is trained not to gossip or share stories. Uh, of course, in today's world, you also need to be careful about what you post on Facebook or LinkedIn or what you send out in text messages. Animal chiropractors also should be careful to get the client's consent. Now I view consent as a process. It's a pr process of educating the client about what animal chiropractic is about, what it can achieve, what are the benefits of animal chiropractic care, but also warning them that there may be situations where animal chiropractic care may not be effective and there could be situations where animal chiropractic could cause injury to the patient. And they need to make sure that the client is aware of those situations. Now, part of the reason for doing that, and, and certainly a big part of the reason for that educational process, is to protect yourself from malpractice claims. If the client has a clear understanding of animal chiropractic, the benefits and the risk, and the client agrees to proceed with animal chiropractic, it's very rare that the client will then come back and sue the veterinarian or the animal chiropractor because of a bad result. If it's something that was anticipated, they know what the risk is, they accept the risk, and if it turns out to be a risk that occurs, then that's usually the end of it. And I think the other reason that consent is important is it's really all about the client's freedom of choice client should be allowed to decide what care their pet, their animal receives. And sometimes there may be a dispute whether traditional veterinary medicine is more appropriate or whether animal chiropractic care is more appropriate. And in those situations the, the client should be allowed to make the decision and the idea of consent is to give the client enough information to make an informed and educated decision. 
Animal chiropractors also have a duty to remain competent. Animal chiropractors should take classes like this one at Parker University so that they obtain the skills to provide animal chiropractic care effectively and safely for their patients. They also have an obligation to keep their skills sharp. Again, animal chiropractic is a fairly young profession. Chiropractic has been around for more than a hundred years. Uh, and I know veterinary medicine has probably been around longer than that. But those professions are a little bit older and even in those professions you still see a lot of new developments, a lot of new information coming out on a pretty regular basis. I expect the same thing will happen in animal chiropractic, especially as the profession grows and as the profession gains more experience about what works and what doesn't work. Part of your obligation as a professional is to continue your education and to continue to stay up to date on what's right and what's the best care for your patients. Animal chiropractors should also be ready to seek consultations and referrals. Now, for chiropractors who are treating human patients, most of the time they can treat the patients on their own. They've got the information to examine, diagnose, and treat the patient. But when they're working with animals, the education of chiropractors is not nearly as extensive as the education of veterinarians. And there may be and probably will be situations where the chiropractor sees things or sees problems or has difficulties with a case where they should be ready to seek a consultation and a referral from a veterinarian and, and really take a team approach rather than an individual approach take a team approach to providing care for the patient. Now this isn't just directed at the chiropractors it's also directed at the veterinarians. Uh, veterinarians certainly are well trained in animal care, diagnosis and examination and treatment. But they don't have the, as extensive of an education in chiropractic as the chiropractors do. Now keep in mind, just like the chiropractors are only taking a brief class uh, to learn about animals, the veterinarians are taking only a brief class to learn about adjusting animals. And there may be situations where veterinarians should be working with chiropractors who may well have more expertise about the chiropractic adjustment. Of course, like any profession, the fees of the animal chiropractor should be reasonable. Now, I've never seen a rule that really spells out what a reasonable fee is. And certainly this is something the legal profession struggles, struggles with. Many people look at lawyers' fees and think they're unreasonable, but I think considering the amount of skill involved, the amount of demand for the service, and, and the, the community uh, rates or the market rate in the community uh, should all be considered in, in developing a fee schedule that's reasonable. Uh, professionals like animal chiropractors should also obey the laws. Not only should they obey the laws, but if they become aware of violations, they should make reports of those violations to the appropriate authorities. Okay, you don't report the violations by telling all your colleagues, hey, do you know what Dr. So-and-so is doing? You report the violations by notifying the appropriate state agency that something's amiss and let them investigate and decide what the right course of action is. Animal chiropractors have a freedom to choose their patients and their clients. Just because a client is presenting a patient to you does not mean you have to accept that person and that animal as a patient. There will be some clients that you should not work with. You may see red flags that indicate there's a malpractice risk or you may see red flags that tell you this person is not making a decision that's appropriate. And those are the kinds of clients you probably want to steer away with. But even though you have a, a ability to choose your patients and clients, you also have an obligation to not abandon your patients. 
once you have started to provide treatment. You should continue to provide that treatment for the patient and the client. And if you're going to terminate the doctor-client-patient relationship, the animal chiropractor should provide enough notice to the client for the client to find an alternative or a replacement for the care that you provide. So that's a real quick overview, a 20-minute overview of the rules of ethics for a profession. Uh, obviously, I'm not trying to get into too much detail in those rules, but I want you to think as you're, you're practicing and as you're making decisions, think about some of those issues, conflicts of interest, having reasonable fees, being honest with your clients and your colleagues, etc. The next topic I want to talk about are the licensing rules and regulations. Now, this is a fairly difficult topic for me to cover because we've got 50 different states and every state has its own rules about veterinary medicine and about chiropractic and a few of them even have rules that address animal chiropractic specifically. And those rules are not static. The boards are constantly changing them. The legislatures are constantly changing the statutes. So it's somewhat difficult for me to cover this. As we go through this topic, I'm going to make references to rules in Texas, as well as the rules and statutes in a number of other states. If you happen to be aware that any of my references are not accurate or are out of date, please send me an email and let me know so I can correct this, this lecture in the future uh, and provide accurate information to students. Uh, if you'll send me an email, I will also post a, a notice and announcement for the animal chiropractic class so that everybody's aware of the update or the corrected information. Now, as we look at these rules, I'm, I'm going to tell you that some of you are not going to like, primarily the chiropractors, are not going to like what these rules say. And I want you to think about how you react to the rules. You know, one way to react to the rules is to just get mad about it. Can't believe the government adopts a rule that ridiculous. Can't believe the government is interfering with free enterprise and consent between the client and the animal chiropractor. And before you get too upset about that, and before you focus on that anger, I want to give you share a few thoughts with you here. First one is from Buddha. Holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intent of throwing it at someone else. You are the one who gets burned. So you can get mad about these rules, but I can guarantee you the Board of Veterinary Medicine and the Board of Chiropractic Examiners are not going to get upset about it. They're not going to get hurt. That anger is going to do more damage to you than to them. And these last two quotes really have to do with identifying the reality you're in and changing the way you react to it. Now, William Arthur Ward said, the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change. The realist adjusts the sails. My recommendation is that you ought to be the realist. The rules are what the rules are. Figure out the best way to conduct yourself under these rules, to follow the rules, and to provide the best benefit for your, your clients and your patients and for yourself. And then lastly, the, the quote from Maya Angelou, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. Certainly the area of rules with animal chiropractic is a new and changing area. As a member of the profession, you may very well have a chance to give input and try to get the rules changed. And if you can change it and improve the rules, that's great. But if the rules aren't going to change, then don't get upset about it. Change your attitude and, and accept that the rules are what they are and adjust your sales like William Arthur Ward said. So the general purpose of these regulations is to protect the public, protect the clients, protect the animals. To accomplish that, the rules want to make sure care is provided by someone who is properly trained and qualified. 
In other words, the veterinarian or the animal chiropractor or the chiropractor has the skills and the knowledge to provide care safely and effectively. The rules also cover the topic of informed consent. In several places as we talk about these rules, we'll discuss some rules that require specific consent to animal chiropractic care. Uh, the rules also provide or require honest advertising. General rule on advertising for almost every profession, really for almost every business, the general rule for advertising starts out as a simple basic rule that says advertising cannot be false, misleading, or deceptive. And what happens is we start with that general rule and then as people try to find the boundaries to that rule, the boards start to adopt specific rules to address specific types of advertising that they have seen. So the advertising rules, I'll tell you, are all over the board when you start to get into those specifics. Uh, whatever state you're practicing in, make sure you understand what the advertising rules are. Make sure you follow them carefully. Uh, the regulations also are intended to provide for quality of care, for care that meets the standards of the profession. And they generally are going to regulate malpractice and record keeping requirements. So the first topic is who's properly trained and qualified? Who can adjust animals? Uh, veterinarians in every state have a general license to provide treatment for animals. If there's a treatment that's appropriate for animals, veterinarians can provide it. So even though a veterinarian may have received no training at all in chiropractic adjustments, the veterinarian has a license that allows them to adjust animals. Now that may not be the best practice. And, and for the veterinarians who are taking this class, I do commend your effort and I do commend your, your dedication to your patients to develop this skill rather than just accepting you have a license to do it and, and providing it carelessly to your patients. Uh, chiropractors have expertise, as I mentioned earlier, they have expertise with the chiropractic adjustment, but not necessarily with animals. Um, chiropractic training by itself really gives no training about animals. And even the chiropractors who take a continuing education class like this will know a little bit about animals, but, but I have to tell you the training from this class, as good as it is, is merely a fraction of what veterinarians learn in their years of veterinary school. And the rules also talk about laypersons. And when laypersons can adjust animals and what training or supervision needs to be provided when they are adjusting animals. Anyone who practices without a license uh, is committing a criminal violation. Uh, I'm going to warn everybody now that veterinarians or, or, or the veterinary boards are very protective of their professions and they are very cautious, very suspicious when people provide services that involve the care of animals. Uh, certainly there's been an ongoing dispute in Texas about dental care for horses and whether that can be provided only by veterinarians or by others. And I see the same kinds of issues coming up with animal chiropractic. The initial response of the veterinary boards, without fail, is, is very clear. They want to protect the veterinarians. They want to be sure that the animals are being cared for by somebody who's properly trained and qualified. So when they see animal chiropractic occurring, they may very well uh, react negatively to it. They may very well feel a need to investigate because it's something new and different. So you want to be careful that you're following what the rules allow you to do 
so that you're providing care in an appropriate way underneath the rules using proper supervision and with the care being provided by somebody who's properly qualified. Failure to do that can result in criminal consequences. Somebody can be sent to prison. The State Board can also obtain an injunction or issue a cease and desist order to the person who's practicing without a license. Now the chiropractors who practice veterinary medicine without a license may also be subject to being licensed, sanctioned by their chiropractic board, having their license revoked or suspended or probated because they violated the laws concerning veterinary medicine. Um, nearly all of the, the chiropractic acts have some general provision that uh, chiropractors are supposed to be of uh, good moral character. Uh, Texas law allows the board to discipline chiropractors for grossly unprofessional conduct. Certainly violating the law would be an example of grossly unprofessional conduct. So not only do you run a risk of getting crosswise with the veterinary board, but you also run a risk of getting crosswise with the chiropractic board. And then lastly, there's a risk of civil liability. If a unlicensed person is providing veterinary care for an animal. There is an assumption that they are liable, that they're providing care carelessly or negligently, so that they would be liable for any damages they cause from providing that care. So it shifts the malpractice burden quite a bit and makes it much more difficult if there's a bad result, makes it much more difficult to successfully defend a malpractice case. So for all those reasons you want to be careful that you are not practicing without a license. Now of course if you have a license to practice veterinary medicine this probably isn't a concern for you. But for those of you who are, are, are chiropractors or don't have a license to practice veterinary medicine you need to be careful that you observe these rules. Now as I, I reviewed the, the rules in the states I basically saw three different schemes for addressing animal chiropractic. First one is silence. These rules simply make no mention of animal chiropractic and it's not clear just from reading the rules what the right response is or who can provide chiro animal chiropractic care. A fair number of states have used this second scheme where they specifically define veterinary medicine as including animal chiropractic. Now, just to be clear, all the states, I think, define practicing veterinary medicine. But the second set of, of, of states actually mentions animal chiropractic, and they specifically say it's a part of veterinary medicine. Now, that means that the only people who can provide chiropractic care for animals or licensed veterinarians or people acting under the supervision of a veterinarian. And then the question becomes, okay, if they can provide care with supervision, how much supervision is required? And by the way, what qualifications exist before somebody can adjust an animal? Uh, do chiropractors require additional training and do veterinarians require additional training? And then the last scheme, which, which as far as I can tell exists only in Oklahoma, uh, it actually allows certified chiropractors to adjust animals without supervision or referral from a veterinarian. So Oklahoma, which of course is the home of the AVCA, leads the uh, pack in terms of allowing chiropractors to work with animals. Bottom line. If the scope of veterinary medicine includes chiropractic, then only a veterinarian or someone acting under a veterinarian supervision may practice animal chiropractic. So for the chiropractors taking this class, that, that's a pretty stiff limitation on your freedom of what you can do. And the reason that limitation is there is partly because veterinarians are suspicious of your skills. and partly because 
your training in working with animals is not nearly as thorough as the training of a veterinarian. Now the way that can be overcome, and it's going to take time, but the way to overcome that is to demonstrate that you are well trained and well qualified and that you provide good appropriate care that's effective and safe but also showing that you're willing to consult with and work with veterinarians and demonstrate the quality of your knowledge and the quality of the care you provide when you're working with those veterinarians so that they learn to trust you and as they learn to trust you hopefully over time uh, chiropractors who are trained in animal chiropractic will be allowed to have more freedom uh, in their treatment of animals. So starting with the first scheme of silence, uh, as I mentioned earlier in many states the regulations don't refer to animal chiropractic at all. Now in one case in North Carolina an argument was made that a chiropractor because they have a chiropractic license should be allowed to provide chiropractic adjustments to animals without supervision by a veterinarian. Now what happened in that particular case is the trial court looked at the North Carolina Chiropractic Act and the Chiropractic Act talks about the spine but that Chiropractic Act did not make any reference or limit it to the human spine. So the trial court in that case decided that the chiropractor should not be held criminally liable because the Chiropractic Act wasn't clear. Now I don't think this is a very strong argument and I think as, as I've looked at Chiropractic Acts nearly every one of them makes reference to humans and the human spine. So chiropractors are licensed to work on humans not to work on animals. So even though the chiropractor in this particular case was successful, I don't think that's a good argument to pursue. Now this Michigan case I think is more typical of the results you would see. Uh, parts of the Michigan Chiropractic Act referred to the spine without limiting it to human spines. But other parts of the Michigan Chiropractic Act did refer to human spines. So what the court did was to look at it in context and say, you know, if you look at it in context, the scope of chiropractic does not include the treatment of animals. So the chiropractic license does not give the chiropractor authority to work on animals. So in this case, the chiropractor was disciplined by the Board of Chiropractic Examiners for treating animals without a license, practicing veterinary medicine without a license. Uh, here's an uh, opinion from the Attorney General in, in Arizona about their Veterinary Practice Act in making a conclusion that chiropractors uh, simply by having a license to practice chiropractic are not authorized to practice veterinary medicine. In other words, they cannot provide chiropractic adjustments for animals just because they have a chiropractic license. They would be required to be working under the supervision of a veterinarian. Uh, similar type of situation in Pennsylvania involving acupuncture. And again, the Attorney General issues exactly the same opinion. Uh, the Attorney General says providing acupuncture to animals uh, is covered by the Veterinary Medicine Act and it should be provided only by licensed veterinarians and it should be regulated by the Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners. Uh, people who are licensed to practice acupuncture on humans do not have the authority just by that license to practice acupuncture on animals. So that brings us to the second scheme first scheme is silence. There's no mention of animal chiropractic in the statute or the rules. The second situation, which I think is adopted by a fair number of states, not a majority, but a fair number of states, involves a definition of the practice of veterinary medicine 
that specifically says, specifically mentions animal chiropractic or manipulation and says that's part of the practice of veterinary medicine. Okay, and, and most of the definitions of veterinary medicine are extremely broad. This, this uh, slide has the statute from Alabama and if you look at it, pretty much covers everything and then right in the middle of it uh, is the word animal chiropractic. So clearly that's part of the practice in Alabama. Uh, Alabama's act then goes on to also say that it's practicing veterinary medicine to represent to the public, to advertise that you have an ability or a willingness to perform any of those acts that are practicing veterinary medicine. It's also a violation to use a title or words, abbreviations, etc to misrepresent your credentials as though you were qualified to practice veterinary medicine. Uh, Texas also has a, a rule. Now the statute for veterinary medicine does not mention animal chiropractic, but some of the rules adopted by the Board of Veterinary uh, Medicine Examiners doesn't make it very clear that animal chiropractic and musculoskeletal manipulation are veterinary medicine and they're considered to be an alternate therapy to traditional veterinary medicine. Uh, Tennessee also has a regulation that specifically says veterinary medicine includes chiropractic as well as a bunch of other things. Now here I've got a list of, of statutes from a number of states. I'm not going to tell you this is uh, all the states that mention animal chiropractic in their statute or regulations but it does give you an idea of the number of states that have decided to include animal chiropractic within the definition of veterinary medicine. So if you're in one of the states, by the way there's 49 of them, if you're in one of the states that is silent about animal chiropractic or you're in one of the states that specifically identifies animal chiropractic as being veterinary medicine, in those states my recommendation is that animal chiropractic should be provided only under the supervision of a licensed veterinarian. It should not be provided outside of that. Now that brings us to the next question which is what kind and how much supervision is required. And in a lot of these rules and regulations the states have not specifically defined what level of supervision is required. When the states do talk about the level of supervision, they generally talk about three types of supervision. And for different practices and procedures, and for different uh, uh, skill levels of the uh, uh, employees, different levels of supervision are appropriate. The least amount of supervision is referred to as indirect in most states. I think Texas refers to it as general supervision and really it means only that the veterinarian providing the supervision is available to communicate. They don't have to be on the premises, they don't have to be observing the adjustment, they simply have to be available to communicate uh, probably by telephone would be best. Uh, direct supervision requires that the veterinarian be on the premises. So in, in a typical animal hospital setting, the veterinarian may not be in the room where the adjustment is being performed, but the veterinarian must be on the premises so that if there's a problem, they can be uh, become involved in the care of the animal fairly quickly. Now immediate supervision is the highest level of supervision, and I really view that as almost having the veterinarian look over the chiropractor's or layperson's shoulder. The veterinarian needs to be available to intervene immediately if something goes wrong or if the, the person providing care needs help. So here's another definition of indirect supervision. Uh, Alabama again, like I just mentioned, defines indirect supervision as being the veterinarian does not have to be on the premises, but the veterinarian has provided some instruction for the treatment of the animal and the animal's been initially examined by a veterinarian. Um, 
Alabama also defines direct supervision. Defines direct supervision as meaning the veterinarian is on the premises, quickly and easily available, and the animal's been initially examined by the veterinarian uh, and examined by the veterinarian at other times as appropriate. And then Alabama defines immediate supervision, meaning the veterinarian is in audible and visual range, meaning the veterinarian can hear and see the animal patient and the person treating the patient. Arkansas includes a similar definition about immediate supervision. Uh, that Arkansas definition comes out of an attorney general opinion. It means the veterinarian's direct observation with the opportunity to advise or intervene in each chiropractic veterinary procedure. So under Arkansas law, veterinarians like veterinarians in every other state can provide animal chiropractic. But chiropractors can practice animal chiropractic only if number one, they're licensed to practice chiropractic in Arkansas, two, they're certified by the AVCA, and three, the care is provided under the immediate supervision of a licensed veterinarian. Now that's the highest level of supervision and I believe Arkansas is the only state that requires that level of supervision for animal chiropractic care. Uh, for whatever reason they have made that decision and, and if that rule is wrong and can be changed and you're working in Arkansas I hope you'll work with them to improve the rule and to recognize the skills of the animal chiropractors. Uh, but if you're practicing in Arkansas, I recommend that you follow that rule until it gets changed. Texas rule is, is much more lenient. Uh, it requires first that the veterinarian have a valid veterinarian client patient relationship. Uh, the veterinarian must have examined the animal and have signed or, or the veterinarian must have in their records an acknowledgement signed by the client that they've been advised that chiropractic is an alternate therapy. Now once those three conditions are met, we have a valid relationship examination and a signed acknowledgement, the veterinarian can refer the animal to a, a, an animal chiropractor and only has to provide direct or general supervision. General supervision is like indirect supervision. It merely means the veterinarian is available to communicate. While direct supervision means the veterinarian is physically present on the premises. Uh, the veterinarian may or may not uh, be in the same room, may or may not be listening and observing what's going on, but they need to be in the premises. So that's pretty general. Now, by the way, as we talk about chiropractors providing care under supervision, one of the things I recommend for chiropractors, uh, this requirement that the veterinarian have a signed acknowledgement is something that the board will look at when they're investigating the veterinarian. When you're working for the veterinarians, do them a favor. Uh, the chiropractor should also obtain that signed acknowledgement and the chiropractor should send a copy of it to the veterinarian. So that way if for some reason the veterinarian wasn't aware of this requirement or the veterinarian for whatever reason failed to get a signed acknowledgement for this particular client, it helps protect the veterinarian from being accused of wrongdoing by the state board by having that document in the veterinarian's file. The other thing I recommend for chiropractors is they're working with veterinarians is that you send a copy of your records to the veterinarian after you provide the treatment. That helps keep the veterinarian up to date on the animal's care. It also helps the veterinarian supervise care if, if something different uh, needs to occur in the future. It's also a great way to build your relationship with the veterinarians. Uh, if chiropractors are keeping good records, it helps demonstrate their skill helps demonstrate their professionalism, it helps demonstrate their honesty, so that as the veterinarians work with you, they will learn to trust you and will give you more and more referrals and will uh, uh, 
be more confident in the care you can provide for the animals. Uh, New Mexico also has some rules concerning animal chiropractic and they address it in two sections. Uh, one section has to do with non-licensed individuals and the I'm sorry this is not this is, New Mexico just has the one section. Uh, non-licensed individuals cannot practice veterinary medicine which includes chiropractic care except under the direct supervision of a licensed veterinarian and then the, the regulation goes on to define direct supervision. Uh, the veterinarian must have an established valid veterinarian client patient relationship. Treatment must be performed on the order of the licensed veterinarian and licensed veterinarian must be on the premises. Uh, licensed veterinarian must assume liability and the fee must be paid to the veterinarian. So that's the rule in New Mexico. Uh, it requires not a great deal of supervision but a fair amount of supervision and probably those last two points the assumption of liability and the payment of fees are the two that are going to cause the most friction could cause the most friction between the veterinarian and the chiropractor. Uh, Kentucky allows veterinary assistants to work under the supervision of veterinarians and requires generally direct supervision. Uh, California makes it clear that musculoskeletal manipulation is part of the practice of veterinary medicine and that musculoskeletal manipulation may be performed only by a veterinarian who's examined the animal, assumed responsibility, discussed it with the owner, obtained informed consent, is available uh, or has made arrangements for follow-up care, and the veterinarian must have a signed acknowledgement from the client. California also allows musculoskeletal manipulation to be performed by people other than um, veterinarians, licensed doctors of chiropractic, uh, working under direct supervision of a veterinarian may provide animal chiropractic. Uh, supervising veterinarian must complete an, an initial exam of the animal, uh, make a referral. Supervising veterinarian must be on the premises. Uh, supervising veterinarian must ensure accurate and complete records. And if the veterinarian ceases the relationship, uh, the chiropractor must immediately terminate the treatment. Uh, a chiropractor who fails to conform with those rules is practicing veterinary medicine without a license. A veterinarian who fails to conform may also be disciplined for providing unprofessional conduct. So I don't want to spend too much time going over these specific rules from the states but I want you to understand what to look for in your state's rules and I want to encourage you to go back and look at your state's rules. If you're a veterinarian you're probably already generally familiar with the rules that regulate veterinary medicine. Make sure you understand when you work with uh, people who are not veterinarians what kind of supervision you have to provide for chiropractic adjustments. And if you're not a licensed veterinarian and you're going to be providing animal chiropractic care, it's really critical that you understand when you can provide that care and what kind of supervision needs to be provided uh, when you are, are, are delivering animal chiropractic care. So that brings us to Oklahoma, which as I mentioned earlier, Oklahoma has the state that gives the chiropractors the greatest amount of latitude to work on animals without having a veterinary medicine license. Uh, Oklahoma Veterinary Practice Act specifically cannot prohibit a chiropractic physician licensed in Oklahoma certified by the Board of Chiropractic Examiners to engage in animal chiropractic diagnosis and treatment from practicing animal chiropractic and for people or chiropractors who are not certified 
uh, they can provide the care uh, under supervision or, or for animals referred by a licensed veterinarian. A few states have recognized uh, the AVCA certification or give the animal chiropractor a little bit lower level of supervision. Uh, Nevada allows animal chiropractic care by chiropractors uh, if its veterinarian has a valid veterinarian client patient relationship. No supervision is required but the veterinarian is liable for the chiropractor's acts or omissions and within 48 hours after each visit the chiropractor is obligated to send the medical record to the veterinarian. So it's kind of interesting that it says no supervision but also says that the chiropractor has to send the medical records to the veterinarian which kind of sounds like the veterinarian supervising the care and even more that the veterinarian is liable for the chiropractor's acts or omissions. Uh, Minnesota rule is that licensed chiropractors who are registered to provide animal chiropractic may treat animals who have been referred to the chiropractor by a veterinarian. Uh, by the way, the criteria for registration includes uh, certification from the AVCA. Colorado allows registered chiropractors, not all chiropractors, but registered chiropractors to adjust with veterinary medical clearance. Unregistered chiropractors can adjust only if there's veterinary medical clearance and there is direct on-premises supervision by a licensed veterinarian. Uh, animal chiropractic can be performed only by chiropractors and veterinarians. I think that's an important stipulation to note in this law and I think it's important for other states to look at whether that's something they should be adopting to protect animals from, from receiving chiropractic care from lay people who have no training as either a chiropractor or as a veterinarian. Colorado Act also goes on to specify the requirements for education, continuing education, record keeping, etc. So what are the qualifications to practice animal chiropractic? I think I've already mentioned it several times that veterinarians generally don't require any additional training or qualifications. Uh, they're allowed as part of their veterinary medicine license to provide animal chiropractic care. Uh, Oklahoma does have some rules that require malpractice coverage and appropriate training. Qualifications for chiropractors. Chiropractors who are providing animal chiropractic under the supervision of a veterinarian are essentially acting as a layperson. And in most states, no additional training is going to be required. Now, there are a few states that require AVCA or some other certification. I showed you the Arkansas code a little earlier. Uh, and for certification to treat animals without supervision, Oklahoma does require appropriate training and in the regulations they specify that appropriate training is AVCA certification. Uh, for laypersons, most of the veterinary medicine acts, nearly all of them if not all of them, uh, allow owners of animals to treat their own animals. So a layperson who happens to know how to provide a chiropractic adjustment could adjust their own animals. Now if they're not properly trained for it, I certainly don't recommend that. Laypersons can also generally work under a veterinarian's supervision, just like an assistant in a veterinarian's office. And when they're working under a veterinarian's supervision, assuming it's the appropriate level of supervision, the layperson can provide chiropractic care, and virtually none of the states require any additional training for that layperson. So I think one of the gaps in these statutes or regulations is they don't spell out very clearly that only people who have the right kind of training should be providing animal chiropractic. Not necessarily every veterinarian should be providing animal chiropractic care. Certainly not every chiropractor should be providing animal chiropractic care and certainly not every lay person with no training at all should be providing animal chiropractic care. 
Uh, just a quick comment. I, I always viewed this as common sense, but sometimes this question comes up. Is it okay to adjust animals and humans in the same clinic? My personal opinion is it's not appropriate. If you are working on animals and humans in the same clinic, you need to be very careful that you're working on them at different times and that your clinic is cleaned thoroughly uh, before changing over from treating animals to, ch to treating humans. You run a risk of causing an allergic reaction in your human patients. And in some, uh, some patients, that can be a very extreme reaction. And it doesn't take much animal dander to trigger that reaction. So it's just not a good idea from that perspective. You also run a risk of injury to your patients and your employees. We all love our animals. Bottom line is when animals get put in a stressful situation, like in a doctor's office, sometimes they act like animals, and they can hurt the people around them, scratching and biting and worse. So be very careful that you keep your human patients separated from your animal patients so that they're not placed at risk of being injured. And then lastly, just a general comment. Uh, there are a number of chiropractic acts and regulations that require that chiropractors keep their clinics clean and sanitary. In Texas, uh, chiropractors can be disciplined for grossly unprofessional conduct. And one example of grossly unprofessional conduct is maintaining unsanitary or unsafe equipment. I would think equipment that could trigger an allergic reaction would be unsanitary and unsafe. Uh, I can't remember which state this is, MSA, uh, one of the states that starts with M. But the table and equipment used for animals shall not be used for human patients. Again, I think it's just plain old common sense that you should be working on animals and humans at different facilities and with different equipment. So before we take a break, I just want to stop with a few thoughts about dogs. Uh, Ann Landers said, don't accept your dog's admiration as conclusive evidence that you are wonderful. And I like this second one a lot. We give dogs time we can spare, space we can spare, and love we can spare. And in return, dogs give us their all. It's the best deal man has ever made. Uh, Will Rogers said, if there are no dogs in heaven, then when I die, I want to go where they went. Andy Rooney made a very appropriate assessment of human nature. The average dog is a nicer person than the average person. Charles Schultz said all his life he tried to be a good person. Many times, however, he failed. For after all, he was only human. He wasn't a dog. James Thurber, if I have any beliefs about immortality, it is that certain dogs I have known will go to heaven and very, very few persons. If your dog is fat, you aren't getting enough exercise. And then lastly, money will buy you a pretty good dog, but it will not buy you the wag of his tail. So with that, that's going to conclude this first part of the lecture give you a chance to take a break and then come back and watch the next video. Thank you.